everyone watching at home. You're with Adelaide Eternal bringing you our monthly tournament. This one is the Adelaide Eternal Highlander Challenge. We are in the booth. Myself, Sava McClinton, next to... Speck of Wolf, g'day guy. So right now, on the right, we have Nathan Fell, who is on Value Junk. And on the left, we have Nick Jeffries, who is on Jundam. Which deck should we look at first? Let's look at Jundam. So Jundam is very, very similar to... Or at least colours-wise, very similar to Jund lists in Modern. However, you get to gas up all of your creature threats, which is sweet. And you have these awesome interactions that you can't get to play in Modern, like the land-based interactions, uh, Punishing Grove with... Uh, not Punishing Grove. Punishing Fire with Grove of the Burn Willows. And then you've also got uh, Crucible of Worlds with nasty, nasty recursion, including Strip Mine and Wasteland, uh, some Man Lands, and then you've also got some Cycling Lands too, which is really, really good with Life from the Loam. Yeah, look, I think we're going to see uh, a sweet mid-range mirror match here. Um, it is similar to Jund uh, in Modern, although because it doesn't get to run four Goyfs, it can't be as consistently aggressive. So that's why it's got the other things like Gamble and the... Um, Crop rotation and entomb and stuff like that. Um, just I really to give like it a bit those. more versatility because that's what yeah. Highland is about, right? Yeah. You, you know, you run a classic archetype and then you get a little few cheeky flex spots to have a bit of fun with. So. That's it. Speaking of versatility, value junk can be built so many different ways. Junk is one of those decks that's extremely versatile, but the value option is basically where you include all of the creatures that generate value by themselves or generate mana to allow you to ramp out threats that generate value. And then you've got things that are non-creatures that also generate value and interact with the creatures, like Birthing Pod, uh, Skull Clamp to draw more cards off those minor dorks in the late game. And then you've got Planeswalkers as well, topping out with Soren Solemn Visitor and Gideon Ally of Zendikar, which are really iconic mid-range threats. Yeah, look, Sav and I, you and I both played uh, something very similar to this junk we, list. We love our junk, don't yeah, we? We uh, definitely... Uh, <laughs> and yeah, it looks... I was <laughs> going through it and I said, oh, it looks a lot like your list, Sav, and I thought, oh, it looks a lot like my list. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just a sweet classic build. Yeah, what if, a beautiful deck. If you uh, want to uh, see these decks in action, you can watch this match. But if you want to have a deck tech on them, there are deck techs in the 7 Minute 7 Point Highlander series, uh, including Value Junk, and you can get to see some of these lists uh, all laid out and how you might build one. Well, let's go down to the game, Sav. Sweet. Looking um, forward to who, it. Who, you know, without giving anything away, I don't actually, I can't remember who wins, but, you know, who do you think's favoured in this? I believe that Value Junk is probably favoured, uh, mainly because all of its cards are consistently... Oh, look at that. Is that five cards? Speaking of value, <laughs> this is kind of the opposite of value. Well, I like, asked you that before yeah, you knew about the Malik. <laughs> awkward. So his hand has Blade Splicer. Sorry, there's a little bit of a bit of a kind of a configuration error there with the with the camera uh, it's just one of those things in one of those long tournaments you just never really quite get to see how it looks on on screen but it looks like the deck is nice and foiled but unfortunately we won't quite see all that foil it might be a little bit well, that's a dry arbor i reckon so not an ideal start but uh, there's a got... thespian stage though so we're already getting into that realm of of actually having some kind of uh, nasty business happening and getting in there with the dry arbor Put the pressure on, show who's boss. That's it, sending a message with the 1-1. You know, you do what you got to do because uh, unfortunately this kind of game is not going to be won by uh, aggro. Oh, oh, oh the, the, the double, wow. Okay, so we've got Dark Depths and Thespian Stage down there. So one more mana will allow him to create a token. However, this is the kind of match where you might actually not want to generate your token straight away unless you have a mental misstep in hand because uh, quite commonly in mid-range matchups in your game one, you have both Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile in your uh, deck. Well, it's an interesting um, opinion to take because, you know, junk, junk is mull to five. So arguably you could say, I don't actually need the combat. I can outvalue you because I had seven cards and I had a decent hand. Yeah, and um, by the time they have to deal with your your various threats with their Swords to Plowshares, then you finally make your token or you strand the Swords to Plowshares in their hand because they just don't want to cast it. Yeah, it's interesting because you can put yourself down, you know, two lands by doing it. I mean, maybe Jun didn't have anything else to play. Um this you know they saw an opener with the thespian stage combo they said well you know i have to keep that so it's a sweet combo right off the bat so um i'm gonna keep it uh, yeah well here's okay. his oh, it's even better, mana. It better yeah <laughs> even better mana so that now that dark depths also generates actual mana Are both of these foiled out decks they're really nice yeah yeah that's it that's why i was saying it's a shame that the uh 
there's a little bit of a configuration error there with the camera because it's not quite picking up the amazing foil nature, but at least we can have it in our mind's eye and we know <laughs> that these decks are pretty sweetly Ooh. foiled out with original original prints as well on the uh, Treetop Village. There you go. He didn't actually go for the Merit Lace token, so that's really interesting. It's probably because uh, Nick is holding his mana open, so it's a... Uh, and uh, sorry, um, Nathan scared of like an anguish done making or something like that. Yeah, that's it. Like if if Nathan leaves his mana open, doesn't do anything on his critical turn three where you get to generate value, uh, it's probably just threatening something happening. And so yeah, he's got the Swords to Plowshares, the Swords to Golf Clubs in hand, there you go. and the uh, Demonic Tutor from Nick on the left. He is obviously searching for something, and and you know this is where you might search for mental misstep. But thoughts, I like yeah. thoughts. He's there. Yeah. I think this is Agreed. really really well played. Um, you know, as you said, not needing to like blow up two of your lands just to lose to a multi five hand, um, and then taking your time, being patient, and hitting that thoughtsies, and whilst and knowing if you can go off or not, absolutely, whilst... you only, it only takes one swing with the merit lage. That's right. So whilst uh, Nathan is on a mull, you can see the power of the dark depths there because what it did was it stopped him from actually playing blade splicer and applying pressure mm-hmm. because he had to keep that mana open for the counter. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I find, you know, see, in my list, my junk list, I'm more of a combo deck. So I don't have Blade Splicer. And I find, like, the Blade Splicer is actually really, really strong. It puts a lot yeah. of pressure on. But, um, yeah, three mana, you know, it can be a bit um, a bit tough. But if I was mulling to five, I'd want to see Blade Splicer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Being able to catch up in the game, yeah. I mean... Blade Splicer is one of those cards where some people play Locks on Smiter and those kind of things where, which have maybe a little bit more raw power by themselves, you know, interact with the Liliana and against counter spells. However, Blade Splicer is really good because it gives you the same amount of power, but you can sacrifice Blade Splicer itself to uh, Birthing Pod, go up your chain and get a Siege Rhino, and Blade Splicer is a three drop even though it's a 1-1, one, one. so you don't actually sacrifice your best creature, which is your 3-3 three, three golem. That's absolutely right. You can also clamp it. Um, you can also equip it. So, obviously, they want to you know, maybe bolt or remove the 3-3 three, three to lose the power, and then you've still got a cheeky 1-1, one, one, which can equip to a swords or a GDA or something like that, um, or, as you say, to, to pot away. So, That's just right. having that um, extra body, I think, is, re- is really, really good in a list like this. So, Nick here taking the damage, mainly because he knows that if he activates the dark depths to make your token to block sure it'll be a little bit of value in getting rid of a golem but it allows the second main phase of nathan to play something like a liliana the veil i was just about to say i think he's got a liliana the veil you know there's not a huge amount of sorcery speed but there's enough that it's just not worth it because this is your wing con this is how you're winning and there's the token um So as as you said, before assume, you go down to lands, I assume he took the swords to plowshares, right? Yes, he had taken that earlier, and yeah, he is restoration angel. This is lovely. So this is exactly what we're talking about. You get to blink things and generate value. So he's actually blinking the blade splicer, which is the one one, which creates a three three, and it allows him to block in the air just to save himself life. And then on his turn, he'll be able to play that Liliana the Veil. Well, and you know what? Creature. If he hits a siege runner next turn, he can actually go up to twenty one life. Uh, take 20 damage from the Merit Lage, drain three, and swing seven, right? <laughs> yeah, it's legit. It's definitely legit. <laughs> so he was, Yeah, so we swing seven. So, so John will go down to 10, and then he'll take him down to one, and then he'll have lethal on board. So, yeah. you know, it's a, it's yeah, a legitimate sometimes you just, line. You just got to think about what your avenues are. And in this instance, he's going, well, I'm not going to win uh, that kind of a... Okay. Oh, yeah, so that, no. that's gone. So that, was that an ancient grudge? Really nice flashing. Look yeah, at that. I mean, yeah. talk about value. I, we knew that this match was going to see value, and that was just value back to back value. Here, I do think that you don't flash back the ancient grudge, mainly being because if uh, you go to Nathan's turn and Nathan plays Liliana the Veil to sacrifice a creature, you can have two minor open to activate your treetop village, sack your village people, and then you get to keep your twenty twenty flying. Yeah, and also um, if he's got something like a jit or a sword and can equip. Um, to you know, he might want to be equipping to the. the I mean, do we even do the first ancient grudge, or do you say go? Yeah, I I I do them at instant speed mainly because 
uh, the three three golems are tokens. If the three three golems were creatures, then there's so many interactions that the value junk deck can do, like potting them away and you know doing doing crazy cool things for more value. Uh, you know, like the restoration angel play just there. However, the golems themselves are tokens, so then it's limited in the amount of things you can do. Especially since they got three toughness, you're not going to say skull clamp them. If you potted them, you'd be getting something worse. So at the end of the day, in instant speed is probably better on the ancient grudge. Mm. But at the end of, end of the day. It this is what the board state is now, so and it does open. Liliana I feel like Jitty Jitty here actually does. I mean, you know, it's not amazing, but it does keep him alive another turn. Going okay, Jitty equip swing one, uh, two counters on Jitty. I can gain four life, and I can survive um, one more beat. And you know, obviously, it's not a huge amount of pressure. But now you've got a creature equipped to Jitty, and you get an extra turn. So to be a stickler, it's Jitter. But anyway, we have <laughs> well, everything a, you said is as correct. opposed to Jitty. Yeah, Jitter. Because it's a Japanese... Uh, well, Sav, so, we didn't all study at Japanese <laughs> college, mate. <laughs> so here, here, we, here comes a different artifact, uh, a school clamp. And this is uh, <laughs> this is gonna get <laughs> this is uh, probably moot because at the end of the day he's gonna get flown over oh, for yeah. twenty. Well, well, so, there was a two-two um, vampire that was created, totally yeah, yeah, flying. So that's actually dread a real boring, shame. Dread boring yeah. the the dude and getting there with a twenty twenty. So this was a really good example of uh, even though you mull down to five, you can still just gain value. From I think value it was a great channel, effort. Yeah. Was really really nice to see. Uh, but when you're on when you're on uh, the the type of deck that has a combo finish with it, so in this instance it was uh, Jundam with this kind of lands type combo finish. Uh, sometimes you have to identify your role, and in this role, uh, this game, Nick correctly identified that his role was the combo deck. Even though your default reaction is to go, "Hey, I'm going to just outvalue you because you're on a mull," but like you saw, man, va va outvaluing value junk is hard. Mm, definitely even on a mull. And even with Jund, which is another like mid-range value deck, really, you know, when you see something like an Ancient Grudge. Um, Absolutely. Now, if we look at the sideboards, so, oh, here we go. Nihil Spellbomb and uh, the Bitter Blossom and some other things in the middle. Did you see them? Did you catch I thought them? it was Thrun, but I don't think he'd be putting Thrun in here. Well, sometimes Thrun. people bring in Thrun as this big regenerating threat, mm. but the problem is it gets chump blocked by 1-1s one a lot, so... Yeah, it just depends on the type of role you think you're going to be I think in. Bitter Blossom is really, really good. I would hope that I see Zealous Persecution, and I remember I run Zealous Persecution in mine, and that card is really, really, really good and very underrated, I think, in the junk lists. It not only kills tokens, um, you know, it kills random bobs and other um, uh, one-toughness creatures, yeah. But it also lets you, you know, when you've got a gummed up board with goifs and a few, you know, bloodbraid elves and something like that, you just go into swings, swing. They think they've got a, like a decent block. They think maybe you've got a combat trip and then you've got a combat trick for all your creatures and yeah. all their creatures and it makes Love a huge it. difference. So he's taking out Fatal Push because he knows that there's fewer fewer threats. He's taken out Kazali Pride Mage because he doesn't expect there to be many artifact uh, equipment and the like. However, I keep in Kazali Pride Mage in this mainly because uh, Crucible of Worlds is terrifying. So, uh, yeah, everything you've said is correct. I personally, whenever I play Junk... Ooh, okay. Just remember that sideboard. So Thoughtseize came out and... It's running in as well. Wow, they love their thrones. They like their thrones. Yeah. Well, we might end up seeing it. And uh, if if I was bringing Thrun in, if I, w if I was going to do it, it would be when I'm in uh, Nathan's seat where you're on Junk... Uh, against Jundam because Jundam doesn't really have uh, mana dorks. It's got Deathrite Charm and that's about it. But Thrun on the other side, if you're in Jundam and you're fighting against value junk, Thrun runs into roadblocks all the time. It's really, really hard to push damage through with him and you don't have equipment to uh, equip to him to make him an even bigger threat to push through damage and push through you know, triggers, you know, Sword of Fire and Ice and the like. Uh, so the mana dorks are going to pose an issue for him if he does draw Thrun. Um, but on on the previous topic about zealous persecution, every junk list that I have ever played, every iteration of it that I've I've brewed, has always had zealous persecution and zealous persecution number two, as in uh, the potable zealous persecution. Oz of Pontiff. Oz of Pontiff. Yeah. yeah. Oz of Potiff, because you just pot him away into Siege Rhino after you've wrathed their board, and then you know you get your haunt trigger uh, later on as well. It's really really cool. Yeah. Um check it out it's a bit of a complicated card but um it's a sweet little combat trick and you know 
I'm not a massive fan of combat tricks, but uh, <laughs> this one I like, and I think it's really good in the mid range mirror. Um, that's so it. Well, I that's what we I have on our hands. I didn't see what it was, though. Yeah. I didn't well, see that last card. Well, that's what we have on our hands right now, is which is a mid range mirror. And uh, for, for most mid range mirrors, ones where your opponent does not have a combo win, uh, which Nick has. Uh, most of those mirrors you end up trying to find ways to eke out value just constantly which means take out your thought seize do inquisition you know all those kind of you know one for ones that are really bad top decks in the late game and then you bring in these things that are just always good all the time like Kalidus yeah Kalidus is really really strong um so I noticed they're both on the same color sleeves. That'll get confusing. <laughs> which mid-range deck am I on? I uh, draw a hand. Could be the other one. I'm not sure which one my deck I think is. These guys know each other. Uh, yeah, they do. They so... do. We got some great travelers at this tournament. It was a nice one. Thirty play. Oh, so we got Bloodbraid Elf in that hand, and it's going away. Um, I love the number of foils there. It looks so good. Um, yeah, we had a lot of a lot of travelers. We had Broken Hill travelers. A team come down. We had uh, Newcastle travelers. So it was really nice to see. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, so we've got Voice of Resurgence and Lanawar Elves. Batter Skull. Did you catch the others? Uh, there was a land. Okay, that's I good. I did see a land. So well, I mean, land Lanawar Elves. I'll, yeah. I'm, on, I'm in on that any day. <laughs> yeah, with a two drop to follow off. Do you yeah. think Voice stays in in this matchup? So I often take Voice out. It just all depends on what your what your uh, options are to bring in. So. This Jun doesn't have a huge amount of ways to exile, you know, other than an Anger of the Gods or like a Magma Spray or something like that. But um, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I always see Voice as really good in the um, control match. Or Dread Boar and some lands. Because so it does hand. two for one in the sense that, you know, they remove yeah. it and you it's get... It's good with Pod and good with Clamp, all that kind of stuff. But but, but that's what but basically all of Junk's decks exactly. do. Exactly. And, and the initial threat isn't as good as the follow-up threat, which to me feels like, you know, you, I'd rather have it against Control because it's always going to be, a, you know, stronger against the Control deck because the 2-2 body is more relevant. It's basically a pre-sideboarded Control card, kind of. Oh, oh this is really... such a good opening. Oh, man. Yeah. Bang there. Yeah, Lanawar Elf Elf. straight into Lily. Oh, man. Power so of the Manadork, you know? Yes, yep. And this is this is really, really where it shines. Does uh, he have like a lingering like souls the... to back it up? That'd yep. be the dream. But... Although Chund, Chund, I think, you know, he runs Colligan's Command. He's got Ancient Grudge. Yeah, I think just he's gamble. got a few things. Just get rid of Gamble here. That's fair. Um, so, so the yeah, this this is the opener that, that shows you the degeneracy of... And there's a Dreadboard. This is a really... This is shaping up to be a nice match. I mean, if uh, if Lily's stuck around there, it would be advantage bar so far on Nick's... Uh, on uh, Nathan's side. But since Nick had the uh, Dreadboard, I think this is really uh, starting to smooth out a bit more. So we get Voice of Resurgence into another two drop. Oh, Umazal's Jitter. Yeah, nice. that's pretty good. So this is this is going to be pretty strong if he gets to connect with it. But remember that uh, Nick is on a deck with a main deck Ancient Grudge, you know. So sideboard he's probably got even more nasty yeah. nasty business coming out to and stop. He, I, he might have Croson's Grip. I saw in his sideboard might have come in, mm. and um, yeah, he's just certainly got a Colligan's Command, which would be pretty good here. Going like oh, Tank yeah. Command, hit Jitty, maybe even hit Lanawar Elves. Yeah, I mean, a Colligan's Command here would be so good. Uh, so, is that a Demonic Tutor DT, there? Yeah. yeah. Is he just hitting a land drop here? Because that sometimes happens, you know, when you when you just have to DT for your third land drop to make sure that you're on curve. Feels bad having a Feels three. Bad. Yeah, oh yeah, he must be so frustrated. <laughs> so yeah, he showed, it's he good showed land. me. It's a good yeah. land. I mean, it's... If you if you had the choice to fetch any land, you know, then, then this is probably one of the best ones to fetch. And to be honest, um, Punishing Fire here would be pretty good. Obviously, and, you can't cast it right now, but, you know, in the following turn, the GD does connect unfortunately yeah once Jitter connects it's going to be tricky to get around those counters but the punishing fire does just pose this constant constant uh, card advantage which is what you need against a value deck so out comes the uh, the big stag like man carrying a Japanese piece of weaponry and <laughs> and you know flavor I guess f I don't know if we're going for flavor here's here, a but... question Sav if Jund had Bolt there would you Bolt main phase does not let your opponent Ooh, get a token. Yeah, that's really or tricky, isn't it? Or would you bolt yeah. after equips so that the GD doesn't connect? I, <laughs> what, do you, what do you value more? That's that's really, really good. It just depends arguably on... if you've got Punishing Fire, you can yeah. deal with the whole board. Yeah, you might just... Oh, and there's, oh, there's Culligan's Command, yeah. Feuds. Oh, man. So finding having to active, actively find that land was necessary. But here we go. We just go you know, gain, gain for life because that's your only real choice here. 
uh, losing a mana dork is not as not as big a loss, but at the end of the day, dropping down to uh, a a two two creature is a, exactly what Jundam wants to be doing. You know, he's going well. I'm going to stabilize because once I stabilize, I can finish the game with a combo or establish a nasty lock such as Crucible of Worlds and Wasteland. And I got to say, this is where I think that maybe voice, you know isn't as great in this mirror just because it's not a threat you have to deal with if you do deal with it it's still a two for one you know you still get the value but there's no real pressure for a two for a two two right well the slot that he took out was kazali pride mage so Mm. the question is would you rather that is kazali pride mage or not and they're pretty close but once once uh nick drops a crystal of worlds then I, i know which one i'd prefer yeah definitely um but you know, I mean, you just you just saw it then. You know, the the voice by itself isn't isn't a threat. It was the jitty that was making it a threat, and in reality, a dried arbor could be filling that role. Um, mm. The only thing that stops is you know that cheeky. Well, I'm going to bolt in response to you equipping, but um, yeah, it, it ended up in this match being quite easy to play around. Well, Nathan fetched uh, last turn his Misty Rainforest to get a uh, Shock Land. Debatably, that could have been a dried arbor. It just depends on what his plan is, but I can tell that uh, he could he could have also been playing around Punishing Fire, going, well, I need my minor base, and I know that you probably have Punishing Fire if you've got the Grove, so I don't want to have a vulnerable 1-1 one, one on my minor base. Yeah, very good point. Um, course comes down. I think Course is going to be really strong. Course is probably one of... Uh, and, and this is a thing that's been talked about a lot. Course is arguably the best card in mid-range mirrors i think it's fantastic mm, yeah. mm. i mean you have it in your main deck there as a mid-range kind of breaker essentially and you know how we're talking about pre side boarded cards you know pre-boarding the voice and, and so on so wow okay so Break sage is it yeah this is this is sweet uh so getting getting to kill a an enchantment creature <laughs> you can kill an enchantment creature and ramp as well is pretty sweet because now the advantage bar has, has probably it's actually quite hard to tell where the advantage bar is now oh, oh it's just yeah you know spot removal after threat after spot removal yeah that's it and, and every time there's a spot removal spell and some kind of threat being deployed someone's getting eking out some small amount of advantage you know that Liliana the Veil kind of made us both discard but then it got traded with a dread boar and then this Rex Sage killed something but then it got removed so you kind of got half a card off it so yeah Blood here we go. Blood coming off. down that's a hunt master that got sighted in another mid-range of breaker and what have we got here collective brutality or traverse the Ilven world I think it is yeah yeah that's it so traverse traverse allows him to search for in this instance he does not have delirium or not i think he He does have delirium yeah yeah, because he's got sorcery instant creature land yeah Yeah. delirium wow so getting to find thrun Thrun, yeah uh so here we might actually see the power of thrun i know that we were talking about how it's a liability when your opponent has mana dorks but in this instance that voice of resurgence only blocks twice and Thrun itself will stick around, definitely. And Bloodbird Elf gets in for three. The pressure starts. Uh, and I don't think there's too many cards in Nathan's hand. Is it just the one card? Yeah, just a single card. So he's really topping that that top of the deck. But I believe we knew what the top of the deck was because of the the reveal. So yeah, this is just Avacyn's Pilgrim and just bashing in for two. Because, I mean, there's, there's an argument there to blocking with the voice uh, to kill the Bloodbird Elf. But right now... Nathan is in the driver's seat. He is at the pressure. He's, yeah, he's got the life. He's the aggro. He's got the life. That's right. Um, so you just take some beats and you make sure. I think that you we could see face. a block very soon, though. Um, you know, yeah. once he realizes, oh, I'm not top decking well. I just need to stay alive because I can't get there with voice through the throne. Yeah, I'm so not going to race that. He got an opportunistic two damage in there before Thrun comes down. Now Thrun does have a regeneration shield available to him, so uh, you know if there was some kind of nasty effect, which is why I often see damnation in sideboards for you know junk. It just has a single sweeper damnation. You know this, you is, well, this I think, is my like, what what zealous persecution do to this board here? If a zealous persecution go, you swing, you know both of them in or something like that and that he blocks the voice you get to zealous um there's no regen up for thrun so you get to trade thrun with the the voice get in for two damage get your token kill their bot i'll probably have to ask a judge can you put a regeneration shield on a creature uh so like if 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 there was a zealous here can you activate the birds of paradise 
and then activates Thrun's regen because if it does, it taps it. Is that right? Or is it taps it and removes it from combat? I don't know. I gotta, you know, the wording on these things are old, but I know what you mean. Where you're like, okay, just being able to use it as a sweeper and then a way to just trade with something is really sweet. So this is Thrag Tusk. So it's a good one. Yeah, he's saying, look, I'm gonna go wide and I'm gonna make sure my life total is high enough. But all all uh, Nick has to do is just go. I'm gonna sit back. You know, I'm just going to sit back with my guys. I'm not going to apply any pressure now. I'm just going to eventually get you because you're not going to be able to get around my thrum. I mean, I guess that's the point of thrum, right? His yeah. thrum says, you know, it's a 4-4. It's probably going to get in. Uh, and if I'm losing, hey, I can just jump block forever. Yeah. Well, he's chosen to swing. And this is probably, if I'm in Nathan's seat, I'm like, yes, yes, thank you for swinging because now I'm going to have an opportunity to try and swing back. But... He knows something is up, right? Your opponent has all this mana open and... Well, I mean, you can't really effectively block Thrun here either, you know. There's no... Exactly, it's a chump block. There's no, you know, value trade you can make because mm. the Thrun is always just going to regen. As value as Thrag Tusk is with the 5 life and the 3-3 three, three when it dies, you know, um, it's, n- it's never going to be as good as the never-ending Thrun. <laughs> never ending. <laughs> <laughs> When, yeah. when Thrun dies, he makes a 4-4 four, four hexproof to regenerate, you know? When yeah. Thragtus dies, it makes a 3-3. Three, three. I think I know what I'd rather. Yes, yeah, so when Thrun goes to the graveyard, pay two mana. <laughs> Put a 4-4 four, four Thrun token into play. <laughs> you can only control one of these. <laughs> so, um, we get Lily here. Ooh. Yeah, this is pretty strong. I mean, what do you do? Sack Thragtusk and then keep a 3-3? Three, because three? then you have two creatures. Uh so this is Kitchen Finks, yeah, like Nick stabilized here. And that's why he was able to just do that attack. You know, the attack looked ballsy at the beginning, but now you just know he stabilized so so well. Tried up and not what I'd be looking for, I reckon. Not <laughs> what I'd be looking for. No, he's probably not cursing his luck there. Uh, but I mean this is an example of how, you know, you've got a high life total. So you go, well, I tap the top of my deck and I could get a value card. And he finds, you know, he just top decks pod. He pods away his Thrag Tusk, gets, gets a Worm Coil Engine. You know, I'm not saying he has Worm Coil Engine, but, you know, you know that, that, that kind of ability to have, a, you know, dig your value, dig value out by top decking. And that's why you take out Thought Seize and Inquisition and all that. Down to no cards. I don't think there's too many outs he really has for the Thrun. Uh, other than some kind of toxic deluge, but even then, swing here for um, six. Yeah. Well, we can we can literally count his outs because obviously, yeah, his his. Um, Does he run deluge? Uh, deluge is not in there, and same with uh, de- damnation. I I would argue that the only one I'd ever put in these decks is is a damnation, not deluge, but because of Thrun. Uh, because of well, no, it does the same thing to Thrun, um, but. Uh, Damnation's a one hundred percent yes answer, even when you're behind. Whereas deluge, often when you're behind, you you just you can't pay five life. Uh, the three mana is not relevant. The three mana disc, the one mana discount is not relevant to junk, but it is relevant to control decks when they they need to play something for three rather than four. I reckon bitter blossom wouldn't be a terrible draw. You could arguably bitter blossom forever, and then um... scavenging ooze is going to gain them life. Look, there's a lot of ways to hold on in reality. Yeah. You yeah. know, Scooge Ophiomancer is another one I think could be decent. Yeah, Ophiomancer will be really, really nice. And uh, the the Scoos here is going to be sweet in that it can preemptively eat Ancient Grudge when he needs to, but most of the time it's just going to be getting swole. He'll become a 5-5 five, five. this turn, next turn he'll become, uh, you know, a 9-9. Nine, nine. He'll become <laughs> bigger than the throne. Bigger than Thrun, exactly. That's that's the key. But in the meantime, in the meantime, Nick is the master of value right now. He's going. I'm going to outvalue the value junk deck, and I'm just going to just generate wolves. And oh, it's just insane, isn't it? I think Lily is the one that needs to die. I think if you get any sort of free swings in, maybe that Thragtus should have been going at Lily because um, Lily is eventually going to be able to sack the scavenging ooze regardless of how swole he is. Yeah, Lily Lily's good at sacrificing two creatures in this matchup, basically. You know, get a, it just sacks one and then goes up, sacks one. Um, or you get into top deck mode and you just go, okay, well, it's just going to keep going up and threaten its ultimate. But most of the time it's two sack. All right. Be really interested to see how much, you know, I mean, these are top decks from junk. Keep that in mind. This isn't just yeah. junk behind in a board because uh, he got tempoed out. This is top deck mode and he's just top decking 
you know, and that's what it's supposed to do. And I think that's why you were saying, you know, you take out the Inquisition Thoughtseize. Whoa, this is a good... Yes, yeah. Now, now this is a way to get back in the game, isn't it? So what do you do? Do you get Dried Arbor so you can block with the Dried Arbor and then... I guess you're going to... You're going to... I think Dried Arbor is not too bad because you're expecting a Lily at some point. Yeah. um, And you're probably going to block at some point. You can even bash in that Lily and then they're forced to block it and kill it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm. I know the default is you're just going to get the fetch land and so on, but I, I sometimes you know you just go well. I'm gonna get I mean, more obviously the issue is if, if if a bolt comes down and it bolts Titan, you get you no know, value. So I think True, you know I that agree. is the safer plan is to get the yeah. fetch land. So I, I think, think it's this, perfectly fine. Given that he was behind, uh, doing the safer plan is better. You know, sometimes you just got to go like I'm going to do this and, and hope and uh, and he doesn't need to do the ballsy get the. Well, he's double. almost he's almost like stabilized back here, I reckon. Um, yeah, Thrun, Thrun held back, and this is what we were talking about before about Thrun. Like Thrun's good, but when your opponent has blockers, you know it's no true name nemesis. That's exactly right, um, and it doesn't generate value. You know, it doesn't have a combo. And um, when it when you don't have equipment, it almost always trades with like everything in their deck. You know, every decent threat in their deck. You know, all these four, five threes, and and you know four fours and a fencer and so on and so forth. So can... Huntmaster's gonna flip here. Um, and it's going to be able to shock nothing. <laughs> uh, it's a four-four trample, and I guess that's another issue. Now he's got all these four fours lined up against um, a five-five scavenging ooze mm. and a bunch of five threes, which um, which will trade with it. So mm, nice. Um, yeah, I think this Rabbit, is, a, Rabbit this is a really getting complicated board because yeah, the like, Huntmaster and the Lily, you know, given time, will just keep getting a bit of cheeky value here and there. Yeah, but so will the Scoos and so will Titania. Yeah, that definitely. So he's just assigning two damage to the Titania and two damage to Nathan. And, you know, inevitably, it, it, it'll eventually get there just by flippy, flippy back and forth, right? And it's really hard in these matches when you don't have blue and you don't have true name analysis to break these kind of stalls. But one of the big stall breakers is Restoration Angel because it flies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you I'm know, not sure I, what he drew, but we'll find out. I think, you know, Throne is sort of the op- opposite of that. You can see just how much Thrun has sort of gummed up this board where it's not worth swinging for anyone. Um, mm. So now, is this a mind game where Nathan keeps a ha- card in hand, passes a turn, and Nick has to go, well, do I activate Lily and I lose a card? But and it turns out it was just a land or... No, if it was a land, you just play it, right? Because you got Liliana. Uh, not Liliana, uh, Titania. So, hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a real mind game, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think what he would have. Hmm. <laughs> could be just a normal land okay so that is a, a voice of resurgence token so it is a 4-4 four, four at the moment and we have a 5-5 five, five scavenging ooze which threatens to go huge and then we have titania and her her buddy do you think then the jun's combo is going to be the thing that could tie break well it? flying is huge isn't it flying just 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 swinging over with a 2020 swell bro is sometimes the way to finish these kind of stalls this is really the nature of mid-range right sometimes you just stall out but i also feel like that's the whole point of the equipments right i mean that's what equipments do is they get you value just for swinging um you know by themselves yeah you know uh don't know what that guy is <laughs> yeah well that's um china's edict it's the from the vault oh, promo that's okay. why you don't recognize the art right it's really obscure the, yeah. the art, but it's pretty sweet art well, that, I think that flashback could be relevant. So, Chinese Edict yeah. is um, Diabolic Edict, but you get to flush it back for seven. So, it's sacrifice a creature, or opponent sacrifice a creature, uh, and you can flush it back for seven. So, he's actually pretty close to flushing it back. And yeah. I think, you know, it hits a 5-3 at the very least, right? Which and he just terrible. used Crop Rot to find a Man Land. So, he's actually, like, diversifying his threats and going to go, I'm going to go so wide that I can go all the way around your dudes. Do you think it m- might have been better to save Crop Rot, see if you hit Thespion or Dark Depths, and then go for that as the tiebreaker? I I would probably do that, but, you know, I'm I'm notorious for holding my cards for a very, very long time. Well, know, I guess if Never you... brainstorming for ages. I just <laughs> want to keep the Crop Rot in hand until I decide whether or not I'm going to, you know, need it. But I can see why he does it here because what he wants to do is threaten that if he top decks a land, he's able to flashback Chainer's Edict. Actually, he doesn't even to- need to top deck a land. Next turn is Chainer's Edict because he's got he's got the, bop. the bird. Yeah. yeah. So and and he's played a spell, so it causes the guy to flip back. Is but I mean, arguably, if spells? he didn't sack the 
the land, he'd still have the mana for the chainers. Yeah, but he that this is why. Sorry, we just found out he he intentionally played two spells in the turn to flip his ah, ravager back to hunt Okay, okay. So he's going to continually I generate that. value. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with I'll that. I'll pay like, that. Mm. Uh, so yeah, holding on. Because I was going to say, I don't think raging as good as raging ravine is. You know, and maybe you don't want to play the yeah. risk that you have to wait to top deck the um, Thespian stage or dark depths. I was like, but if you're not going to really activate the raging ravine, if you're not going to swing with it, there's not much point in getting it. But yeah. I, I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah, to flip it's kind of like master. one green mana sacrifice a land, get a raging ravine, or turn a land into a raging ravine, and get a two two guy. And hunt master threatens to go back into ravager, which is sweet. So this is stone forge mystic. So this is a nice way to break a stall. So you get something like, uh, I guess Jitte is I gone, think, isn't it? Yeah, ooh, so sword. Yeah. It's so got clamps. So Sophie's really nice in these kind of instances. I think Sophie's where you want to be. But I don't believe he plays. It. Unless he Nathan's plays got a specific idea about what he wants. Like he goes, I want clamp because I know there's going to be a lily sack or a chain of mm. edict sack soon. So I know I'm going to get value off it. And yeah, I'll yeah, definitely. Chain into some one ones. But I think he needs to have an idea. What is it that I'm top decking that breaks this? Yeah, because the issue is if you equip Skull Clamp to your He's doom, got life, he's got he's yeah. got board. You know, what what is the thing that you want to get that breaks this up? It yeah. could be Council's Judgment. Uh, some if you if you get clamp here, the th- issue is you make a clamp, you clamp your guy. Your guy isn't a one toughness guy, so you have to attack with him. You attack and your opponent just goes, I'll just take two damage. So, so it doesn't actually ever draw you cards uh, and you can't use it to block because your opponent won't attack you because you've got a clamp. They're just going to wait until they've got a big flying guy or kill you with the Ravager. Okay, so that's um, Fairy Macabre. So Fairy Macabre. Which is actually two-two. isn't terrible. Yeah, uh, this is why it's I play really Fairy good, Macabre. really good, actually. I, I am a very, very strong advocate of a very, Fairy very? Macabre. Yeah. Fairy Fairy? A very, very strong advocate of uh, Fairy Macabre because... Uh, okay, so yeah, here's the Ancient Grudge. Oh, I think that could have... Yeah, he could have eaten that's that fine. earlier, I think, with the Scoos. Yeah, that's awkward. Could have. I think he might have just missed that because he certainly would have been able oh, to keep up Green Man It happens so often. When you've got a flashback card in there and you're not used to uh, the the singleton nature of Highlander where there's the Ancient Grudge and there's only ever one flashback card and it's always in and it's in their graveyard. Yeah, and it is a very complicated forget. board state. But I think, yeah. you know, even without the Clamp, Fairy Cup here is pretty good. It gets yeah. rid of Lily. Uh, first and foremost, and it is eventually going to get in there. Although the issue is, Huntmaster the fell flip will kill it. Yeah, true. So that it, uh, Nick has really managed his Huntmaster really well, which is a nice way to just eke out constant advantage. And he's going to try and cast two spells this turn probably. So that is a that is the Deathrite Shaman, is it? Because it's a one one mana with a Golgari symbol. So it looks like Deathrite, I assume. Yeah, I like ticking up Lily here. No point in just killing your Lily for no. Um, for no real value. Yeah, Just fetch keep it around. Is huge. Yeah, fetch lane's good. It's another five three. It's another thing to sack to Lily. It's essentially take two counters off <laughs> Liliana, right? I think um, he wants to play a spell here though. Yeah. Because he wants he, to he can't, he, he doesn't have anything. Oh, but no. he can just make his scavenging his real swole and So he can he's probably eaten all the yeah, creatures. Sw- swing at Lily. He could even block with but birds to keep Lily alive, although Lily, but then Chainers Edict survives active. anyway, right? Yeah, I think you just go. I oh, just take two off Lily, yeah, because then you still have Chainers Edict active. Yeah, I think this is pretty good. Um, I, I'd be interested to see if that uh, Skull Clamp would have made the difference. So you could have gone like Skull, skull Clamp equipped to Fairy Macabre here, yeah. you know, and that makes sacrificing like definitely really bad because that's basically what he's got going for him. He's got Lily second Chainers sack. And it makes the sacrificing pretty tough if you can just equip your worst creature and get two cards out of it. Yeah, I love putting Sword of Fire and Ices on uh, on Fairy Macabre. It's always fun. But yeah, he has Batterskull in his deck, so it's a possibility that uh, the Ancient Grudge gets removed and then he uh, makes the Batterskull off the the Stoneforge and then equips it to the Fairy Macabre and then bashes in for seven and then really, really kind of breaks up the life imbalance constantly by having a flying threat. So I think Hunt, Hunt Master's... So they're in end step doing scavenging use things. Yeah, Hunt Master's going to flip. Yeah. Well, this is a lot of 5-3 tokens, but at the end of the day, as you've seen, this game doesn't get won by chunky ground pounders, does it? The game gets won by some You get some enough way of them. To, yeah, definitely. I mean, but if you, if Throne you can only way, block one. But if you find a way to break up your stall... Sometimes it's about a flying creature or an equipped creature that has some kind of imbalance in power and toughness that allows you to push. Uh, look, I totally uh, agree. I mean, I- even if he swings out here, 
Throne blocks Titania. There's your like constant source of power gone. Um, you know the Wolves can block and trade with a five three. You can take five and you can block and regen the Scoos with Thrun. You know. You, yeah. And you're not, you're not really anywhere, are you? That's it. And so that that Huntmaster of the Fells has generated a large amount of a value, hasn't it? It's made two Wolf tokens and it's killed one two two creature. I think yeah. it was and, and done four, and to done the four face. damage. So, I mean, this is why Huntmaster is there. Like, it's it's for the mid-range uh, grind and occasionally an aggro stall. Lingering Souls is amazing. Ooh, yeah. this, is, this is, like, the best, <laughs> one of the best ways to get around Liliana and over the top of Ground Pounders. Yeah, it's a real threat. Make sacrificing bad. Yeah. Um, and Huntmaster is going to have a hard time actually killing four of them over the course of, you know, eight turns. This is really, really difficult. So here's going to be two one ones, and I would definitely flash it back right now. Reason being, your opponent can draw Scavenging Ooze, and that's a nightmare. Yep, and he still gets two greens up for his own skews. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, is that so? Is it Deathright Shaman? I assumed it was Deathright Shaman. So yeah, he has to do it regardless because if he doesn't cast it, then at the end of the turn, Deathright Shaman eats it. So, um, so what do we have here? Okay, so Huntmaster triggers because two spells were cast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> to get another 2-2. Two, wow. two. And, and worse still, the Huntmaster is flipped, ready to flip back again. This guy has done four, so much work. The 4-4 four, four buddy isn't really that relevant. It's more that when he's in this state, he's ready to go yeah. to flip to kill he's another so, Souls token. Yeah, exactly. That's it. And then he's got all these puppies on the ground ready to go. And there's been stage. Make a copy of Raging Ravine, you know. Uh, did, so so maybe that isn't Deathright Shaman because I didn't see an activation at the end of the turn. I didn't see an activation either unless but he's missed it. Some, no, sometimes you just force it. He could have been forcing the scavenging ooze because sometimes you just go, I'll activate this, then he's, he uses up mana to do the scavenging ooze and then you get to untap on your turn with your Deathright. Here we go. No spells cast and again he kills a token, does two damage. This this Huntmaster, I, think, I don't think I've ever seen... Huntmaster of the Fells and Ravager of the Fells do this much yeah, work. Yeah, he's really good in this game. I think, you know, the Thrun was is doing a lot for the Scoos, but the Huntmaster is stopping some Alpha Strike come yeah, down, you know? that's it. So we kill Lily, two damage to the face. So this game, basically Nathan's going like, and he knows that this game's going to be won by the Flying 1-1s one uh, if he can get them in in time before Ravager flips, you know, back forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. And he only plays one spell here, so Ravager... Uh, does not go back. And Kitchen Finks there doesn't really do a whole lot. Just says, <laughs> yes, we are definitely still stalled in this board state. <laughs> definitely still stalled. No questions about that. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a really, really big fan of uh, trying to eke in as many flyers as you can into value junk. So a lot of the time, yeah, I put Fairy Macabre in the sideboard, Resto in the main deck, and sometimes I've seen people use uh, Archangel of Thune in the main deck, which is a really good mirror breaker, as well as Lingering Souls is awesome. Is that but, Pulse? Um, I, even Mind Sensor is the other Maelstrom one. Maelstrom like. Pulse. Maelstrom yeah. Pulse finally kills this massive bro. 1313. Yeah, he's a big boy. Swole Lord. And he's going to have a few more life gains before. Um, but it doesn't matter how swole you are, you still get pulsed, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, so yeah he's just going to eat a couple of things um, looks like he's also eating just lands is that right just just to go okay please don't have draw titania I'm going to eat your lands kind of thing yeah interesting choice Yeah, so, I, think, I think it's perfectly fine because which implies uh, that it's not a death right shaman because otherwise I'd be taking out sorceries I think yeah did did he eat uh, did he eat the chainer's edict Oh, very good question. I assume he did. I just I I hope so. That he yeah, did. that's so here's entomb. Entomb. Yeah, yeah. This is great. So he got to pulse the guy away, then cast in tomb. So he's he's got his uh, punishing fire probably available into the bin. Uh, the thing's not going to get removed, and he uh, gets to flip his ravager back again because he cast two spells. Is that right? Yeah, punishing's actually going to make it really easy to manipulate your hunt master because you don't have to cast it and. Um... Yeah. You can also cast two spells. You can have it in hand, cast it, get it back, cast it. Yeah, um, I love it. And and for those who haven't played mid range decks before, uh, little niche interactions alongside your amazingly powerful haymakers and value trains and so on are what make these decks exciting to play. 
So another flip here, <laughs> another <laughs> gain two life. I don't think the Souls is actually going to be out of beat. No, I think Huntmaster not just trumps Souls. Well, well, Punishing Fire plus Huntmaster is just able to grind out. Hunt, uh, flips yeah, constantly. Punishing Fire for sure, but I think I think Huntmaster alone. Yeah, Huntmaster alone is what like eight over eight turns or something. It's Probably gonna yeah. Average, well, the Souls because the Souls tokens. can't actually kill fast enough because the Huntmaster gains the two life as well. Yeah, the life gain. And they're both yeah, on twenty point. life. Very good point. <laughs> It's 2020. <laughs> they have one Nick and Nathan both have the power and toughness of Merit Lage. <laughs> ah, there's so an. I mean, I feel three. Merit Lage is an, is another breaker that I'm still waiting for from Jund. Just waiting for that top deck rip. Yeah, uh, is that is that why you would have found Thespian Stage with your? I think I would have kept Crop rather than because at the end of the day, you know, the Huntmaster flip was cool, but if he had two less life. And one of the less creatures, or if that meant a flip back, you know, it must did, not be. Did the Huntmaster flip really matter? Or if he had a crop rot in hand, could in, he go, okay, I found Thespian Sage, now I crop rot for Dark Depths, and I win? Yeah. Uh, so we we had Eternal Witness there return something, and again, it must not be Deathrite Shaman if, if things are not being exiled. So we're just going to have to find out what that card is that has a watermark at the bottom. Uh, it's just because it's quite far away on the screen, quite dark so it's probably golgari but uh so punishing fire hits titania once yeah and obviously he's able to uh do some nasty shenanigans here yeah very nice and there's punishing fire for you if you've got the resources if you've got the time which um this this game obviously allows you can just do this i mean you can just do this with a face eventually <laughs> right like eventually you can just go like yeah for it's three really because you have to force them to gain a life you know it's just one damage each punishing fire you know yeah definitely just ping away at them. <laughs> <laughs> uh but i think actually um nick's in a position where he can start thinking at least about swinging with um throne is it murderous red cap is that what it is? Mm. I'm still, I'm still figuring only, out what it is. I thought he was. only played one for it, though. But yeah, I think you know you could yeah. start thinking about swing with Thrun here because, yeah, the Titania tokens can swing you back, but he's actually got pretty decent blocks with going like double block with Wolf tokens and um, Kitchen Fing and yeah. trade there. You keep your Hunt Master around and alive. Um, you know, I think it's relevant, especially with Punishing Fire, to start chipping away at him. Definitely. Uh, chipping away at Eternal Witness as well. So these... It is a death right Shaman. Yeah, okay. So it just wasn't activating earlier because of the standoff with Scavenging Ooze? Yeah, I don't perhaps. know, I sometimes just force the activation and just go, okay, I do it and then make them do the thing and then you can... you can, uh, Yeah, so it is a death right Shaman. All right, so death right Shaman can obviously threaten some life loss uh, at end of turns now, now that there's nothing kind of holding it back. But... The the main thing is that you know, everything on the ground is just not doing anything. It's all about doing do, something in the air. Does Nathan have sort of fire and ice in his list? Because I've seen the batter skull and I'm wondering, you know, I know your list no, runs Sophie is, and yep. my list runs batter skull. Yep. And, you know, they're, they're actually quite different because mm. I think Sophie would be better in this board because Sophie's a, a lot better in a board where you already have the creatures and you need to make those creatures better. And then it yeah. makes any one of your threats way better it makes any one of your creatures a threat yeah but better skull is good because it's a threat by itself it's a threat by itself yeah. and when you don't have a lot of creatures when you are top decking you know you don't need to equip and risk you know some big swing that makes all the difference yeah um you know so so there's a lot of pros and cons with with whether or not to run better skull he's just chosen to equip um lingering souls fly fly flyer Vigilant seems pretty flyer. good yeah, this this is how you win a game, right? You just got to get those flyers, or you get the get to get some kind of other evasive threat, or something direct to the face, and and in short order, that batter skull will win the game, uh, equipped to a flyer. There you go. So we found the breaker, yep. and it was batter skull. Uh, well, uh, the breaker was a flyer, right? I and guess this yeah, to be a that's big a good flyer. point. Um, th this is why I try and jam as many flyers into my mid range decks as possible because you just lose so often by going like my. But look at my board. Look at how much value I've generated, and I'm losing to a flyer. Mm. Is he able? He's not going to be able to punishing fire three times here either, is he? Mm. I, was there a position where 
he could have played around Batiscal and not tapped out for punishing fire. <laughs> it's and, possible, yeah. Well, I mean, arguably yeah, he could be doing all these punishing fires at the end of turn and keeping yep. up mana and just going like, my punishing fire deals with every single card on your board. Yes. yes it deals right. with every single card in your deck. Well, not. it depends on how much life because you can only make... Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. But I, you can always... You can yeah. do four damage, right? You can right? do four damage or you could do six damage. Um, uh, I don't know. I guess you can't so, do four damage. But, but, but here's an interesting fact. Batiscal is lifelink. Yeah, lifelink is So you huge. could pay red and get punishing fire back again from their Afterwards, own lifelink yeah. trigger, which means you can get punishing fire back a total of three times in the same turn, yeah. which does six damage, which actually kills the token. Yeah, sweet. And then you just do that the second turn, and you've, you've lost like 10 life, but you have killed all their flyers. Yeah. I think that I think that might be the play, because he needs an answer for this batter skull, and I think he needed to be going, yeah... Punishing fire at uh, Grove give you life. Punishing yeah. fire, punishing fire. It comes. It often comes back to that question of the how do I lose? How do I punt? How do I lose? So you go, okay, how am I going to lose this? I might lose by the flyer, so I'm going to put all of my resources into killing this flyer or all of my resources into killing this equipment or something like that. Um, so the cycling land's pretty sweet here in the top deck mode, uh, but we have a whole lot of things going on on the ground <laughs> uh, it's a very it's a very yeah. sticky sticky board stat. i think that's a scoose yeah so the, the life gain there so is can, gonna be relevant yeah, and, to, and it, to tempo out and we know he's got hunt master and we know he's got shaman <laughs> so he's actually got a lot of life gain yeah so maybe I he'll be hope, able to stabilize and kill I that hope token. he can try yeah yeah i hope he can stabilize and kill the token i mean he's surely i guess he's thinking about the outs that are left in his deck yep and he's thinking, oh, I've got key command, I've got rah, 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 you know, I've got kill spells, I can find an answer for this batter skull. Mm. Um, Temporary answer, and then kill the two tokens. Uh, yeah, yeah. But you know, if there's an answer that you can play right here and right now, you don't need to put it to chance. I think. Yeah, definitely. Very complicated though, and batter skull didn't give much time no. to, to think about it. Right, you know, no, not at all. Um, so that was the tireless tracker that is just generating clues with land drops and drawing cards and then putting counters on it, right? Yeah, so he's looking for an answer. Um, I think, you know, my option of the triple punishing fire is gone now because he doesn't have... Don't have the money. He doesn't have the money and he's got to spend his money to gain life. But but I totally understand what what, what realm of thought he's in there where he's just like trying to dig... He's he's going, I've got so many answers to this, I'll just find one of them because Jundam does have a lot of of answers. But it's at that stage of the game where you've used a lot of them as well, so... (laughs) <laughs> Stop <Stop-master laughs> triggers again. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he's uh, um, wow. That's it. Look at that. So is that one each? Uh, so that was, I believe that's a one-all draw. So they went to turns there. Yeah, yeah. that could have been a factor, to be honest. Absolutely. Um, so I think um, you know there, there was an argument there to like try and somehow stall it out, gain enough life to try and get to the point where you win mm. as a one-zero win, but you know. These guys are friends as well, and they've played a lot uh, with each other as well. So I'm pretty sure they did the honourable thing and, and just uh, just turn things sideways and try and find a win. Um, so that was that was pretty thrilling. I really I'm glad that we got to start our tournament off with some exciting uh, mid range grinds, which you don't get to see in many other eternal formats. You don't get to see many cashews either. So there, there we yeah, go. Yeah, you got to re-energize after something like that. That's it. And we will bring you some more tasty, tasty treats in our (laughs) next round of Highlander coverage for the Adelaide Eternal Highlander Challenge. See you there, guys.